So Jaime uh, Saavedra currently leads the education global practice at the World Bank Group, which is the top education official at the World Bank, uh, where he oversees a uh, $20 billion pro portfolio of education financing. He rejoined the World Bank Group in 2017 from the government of Peru, where he served as Minister of Education from 2013 through 2016, being the first minister to continue in the same position across two administrations. And I know from my work in politics that that is not easy to do. During his tenure with the Ministry of Education, the performance of Peru's education system improved substantially as measured by international assessments. In fact, Peru had one of the fastest rates of improvement in student learning outcomes as measured by PISA among all participating countries. In addition, under Jaime, the university system underwent its largest reform uh, in decades, uh, although the politics of that reform were quite a bit thornier. Prior to assuming his role as Minister for Education at Peru, he had had a 10-year career at the World Bank, where most recently he served as Director for Poverty Reduction and Equity, as well as Acting Vice President, Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Network. And in 2012, Jaime, Jaime co-led the team that developed the twin goals of eliminating extreme poverty and building shared prosperity that since then has defined the mission of the World Bank Group. He's also been executive director of GRADE, which is a leading social science think tank in Peru. And throughout his career uh, as a Peruvian national, he's led groundbreaking work in the areas of poverty reduction and inequality, labor markets, education reform, the economic of education and monitoring and evaluation systems. He's worked with a number of international organizations and think tanks, among them the Inter-American Development Bank, or the IDB, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the International Labor Organization, and the National Council of uh, Labor in Peru. Over the years, he has supported Insania Peru uh, and its efforts to place teachers in classrooms and foster the leadership of its alumni, spoken at global conferences, visited many network partners in their own countries, and worked with us globally to champion the importance uh, uh, um, of developing leadership at every level of the education system. Jaime has also held teaching and research positions in academia and has published extensively, has a PhD in economics from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in economics from the Catholic University of Peru. Now, Jaime was also one of the subjects of a study that I uh, directed on the politics of learning-oriented education reforms for the RISE program. Uh, and I'd like to add some less formal insights from that study that was led by Maria Ballarin mm -hmm. at GRADE, which you used to uh, direct, along with uh, Santiago Cueto. Her overall assessment was that uh, the Saavedra administration was characterized by academic excellence and it's in its ministerial teams, which I think is very uh, interesting, and in your personal openness to evidence and knowledge as key drivers of education policy, as well as to transparency for the actions of the, of the ministry, none of which is easy uh, to do. Um, she said that you emphasized placing pedagogical practice at the center of education policy, and uh, I can give you the words of some of the interviewers, interviewees, who are anonymous, but high-ranking Ministry uh, of Education officials uh, who said that you placed the curriculum at the heart of everything. Um, it, certainly, Jaime was one of the, he would maybe embarrass him, but uh, certainly also true that he was one of the most charismatic ministers in, uh, in the 30 years that were uh, in this study, and he enjoyed widespread public approval, was broadly perceived as a first-class technocrat who could not only implement reforms, but who could understand the needs of teachers and schools. And this is a very, very rare combination. 
just a little bit more to embarrass you, a little bit more. <laughs> I'm going to uh, make you my PR Yeah, exactly. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, this perception, in part, uh, we found rested on his academic and professional trajectory, which had led him to become a chief economist for the World Bank, but which was uh, also expected to translate into his capacity for public administration. But it could also be attributed to his personal style and his capacity for creating dialogue. He arrived at the Ministry of Education with a discourse that emphasized efficiency and learning results uh, and had got through several large-scale interventions which sought to improve pedagogical practice. It's also noteworthy that he lasted four years, or nearly four years, as a minister, given that from 1995 to 2020, Peru had 20 ministers in 25 years. And going up to the present, 33 ministers in 28 years. So to survive four years in that kind of environment is, uh, is quite an accomplishment. And maybe he'll give us some insights into what it means to be a change maker in such a complex and uh, turbulent environment. And another of his main achievements was to increase the budget. Right, from 2.8% uh, to 3.9% of uh, GDP, and which was also partly uh, because of the country's economic growth, but also because he was perceived to be an efficient policymaker who could allocate and spend the budget in a timely manner. So with that, I will turn it over to you. And uh, he's prepared to talk about, about 35 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. Jaime Saavedra. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. I mean, the, um, uh, we can talk in the Q&A a little bit more about the uh, ministerial experience that has, I mean, many of the, um, um, combines the uh, technical aspects of the job with the uh, sometimes com complex, uh, complex political aspects of the job. But um, what I wanted to do uh, here first was to give a very, how to say, 30,000 feet overview of what has happened during the last uh, decades and, and particularly then the last few years and where we are and some of, them, some of the challenges for reform. And just to put things in context first is that I think it's very important to emphasize uh, that we are living the worst education crisis of the last century, right? And not necessarily something that policymakers and societies have internalized, but it has never happened. We have never had globally a shock like we had. We lived during the last um, uh, two or three years after after the pandemic, when countries chose to close schools as a tool to combat the pandemic, and with time we probably know that that was not necessarily the best policy decision. Um, but actually, that was done not necessarily taking into account what was going to be the medium-term and long-term impact of that policy decision on students' welfare. Now, but before going to what happened in those, in those, uh, in those couple of years of the pandemic, just, I mean, where we are, what, what has happened, what are the big trends? And then just in two graphs. Well, what the big trend is that more kids are in school. Right, which is true. More kids are in school, enrollments have increased dramatically, and uh, this is enrollments in, uh, in primary education, so they're close to even 100% in most countries. Uh, that's in primary education, not secondary education. Secondary education, even in middle-income countries, you'll be around 75 and 80, so there is still a, a space to, to grow, and, and, and actually gaps in secondary education in low-income countries are very big still. But yes, we can say at least at the primary education level, well, more kids are in school. But then the question is what has happened with those kids who are now in school? And the problem is that learning has not moved in that same direction, right? Yes, kids are in school, but are they learning or not? And what you see here is data, um, um, uh, literacy data, right? depending on when people were, were born. And, and this is expected literacy conditional on you having finished fifth grade. Right, so you have finished fifth grade, are you literate? And this is a very low bar of literacy. This is just coming from household service, from DHS, is like, can you read a sentence? It's a very low bar, it's just reading a sentence. And then what you see here, particularly if you look at South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, is a clear downward trend. Those people who finished the fifth grade, right, the share of those, of those, uh, of those adults um, that can read has gone down. Right? You see that flat in East Asia and Latin America, but remember, this is a very low bar. This is just reading a sentence. 
Okay, so what we see is kind of in the, in the long term, there has been a kind of a trade-off into quantity and quality. Yes, more kids in school, right? but not necessarily all countries have invested enough in order to maintain quality the way it was when the system was limited to only a fraction of the population. Right? So that's, that's my sense, kind of the big trend, particularly in low and, and middle income countries. And you would say, well, we, maybe that's why they are low and middle income countries, right? Um, and have not moved towards a high, higher income. Now, Starting to move towards the, 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 last, uh, the last few years, one thing that I, we, we thought was important working in, in, with, uh, with our team in the bank the last few years was we have data about learning, right? Not for many countries. There are many countries for which we don't have data and we're flying blind, particularly half of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, we don't have good learning data. Um, but looking at those countries in which we have data, that data was, I mean, known by the education experts. But the key point is that do people in general know what's happening in their education systems? They, they know if their kids are going to school, but do they know if they're learning? So we came with this concept of learning poverty, which is with the same data that education experts will use, but put it in a way that will be easier to understand by anyone. And it was, how many, how many of your 10 year olds Right? Can you read with understanding? Can read and understand a simple text? Right? That's something that anyone can understand. Right? If you can, again, as any parent, said, can you read 10-year-old at the end of primary, roughly, can she read a simple text? Read and understand a simple text. And unfortunately, and this is before the pandemic, that number in low and middle income countries was 57%. That learning poverty was 57%. There's a gigantic number, right? We're talking about kids who are, most of them are in school, most of them are in school, and half of them, or more than half of them, are just not learning, are not having the foundational skills that they will need, that they will need for life. But moreover, there are other, uh, a few other bad news, because you would say about well, 57% is a high number, but maybe there's an improvement. Maybe that learning poverty is in a downward trend, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case, right? Data for 2015, 2019 show that in this 57% uh, was a little bit higher even than the number for 2015, right? Now, if you put confidence intervals, maybe this, it could be even flat, right? But even flat is a very bad, is a very bad outcome, is that things are not improving. Right? So learning was not improving in low and middle income countries. Um, and, and to a certain extent, it's, it's not that we only care about reading, right? But well, first of all, reading is important because I mean, you need to learn, you, you need to be able to, to learn to read in order then to read and learn other stuff. So reading is critical for many other competencies. But on the other hand, if a system can deliver that, can deliver reading, most likely is delivering right, many of the other competencies that we care in an education system. Right? It's very difficult there will be a system that will deliver reading and nothing else. Right? So it's a good signal of the quality of the system. So that was, this is, this is very, very worrisome, worrisome numbers. Now, if you think well, learning poverty should be zero in the same way that extreme poverty should be zero the same way that hunger should be zero, right? We're talking about a basic human right here, right? And it's something that is absolutely critical for children in order to be able to have a productive life uh, and, and be, and be, and be, and be um, citizens that can contribute to their, to their societies, right? So, I mean, so in a, in a way, this is, this is akin to the, uh, that goal of ending extreme poverty, ending hunger. Uh, and these high rates of learning poverty are also an early warning that other education goals might be, might be at risk. Um, this is morally unacceptable, of course, that, that this is happening, and this is happening at this rate. And, and to a certain extent, we can say it's economically unacceptable because actually, as we're going to see later, I mean, we know how to deliver that service, right? And there are resources in the planet to deliver these services to all, to all children, right? So we're really, as a, as a global society and as societies in each one of our countries, I mean, we're really in, in big trouble. Now, COVID came, COVID came, and then countries chose to close the schools. On average, between February 2020 and uh, February 22, uh, 
Globally, school systems lost 141 days. But in South Asia and Latin America, the number was gigantic. It was really, really high. And this is, these are school days. Right? In some countries in South Asia, um, also, in, also in East Asia, I remember the case of I mean, Bangladesh, uh, Philippines, uh, parts of India, um, and then Latin America, uh, Uganda in Africa, there, so across the whole world, there in, so, in some places you lost entire two years. An entire two academic, two, two academic years. Actually, in this, in this graph, what we show is the uh, uh, learning poverty here, initial learning poverty, learning poverty before the pandemic, right? And the number of weeks schools were fully closed, right? Interestingly, I mean, in general, you see that particularly those countries who have higher the rates of learning of, of, of learning poverty in terms of here we it's, it's the here is the, the inverse, right? Here is the proportion of kids who can uh, who can read. So countries who have a very low proportion of kids who can read, like Uganda and Philippines are countries who have the largest, or the longest, I would say, the longest in school closures, right? So, uh, but, but just think in terms of your own experience, right? If when you were 10 and 11, the school system completely disappeared from your lives. That, that is the experience that, that, that many kids, uh, that many kids uh, lived. And, um, we, we then came to try to simulate um, what could potentially be the impact in terms of learning poverty of these school closures, right? In a context in which um, in many countries, despite the efforts of remote learning, right, uh, the efforts ended up being very or unequal uh, and ineffective in many cases. Um, some kids will have... Um, a broadband connection, a computer at home, a space to study, I mean some stimulation with the, from their parents, the, the possibility of interacting with their, with their teachers, while others didn't have absolutely anything, nothing of those, of those characteristics. Um, so we, we made it, we, we started first working with simulations in terms of what this number could be after the pandemic, and the number that we had, or that we still have, is 70%. Right, so an increase of 13 points on this on learning poverty as a consequence of the school of the school closures. Now, um, I, I will then mention a bit about inequality of this of this impact. But I mean, in general, we see that given the given the uh, the extent of school closures, given the uh, uh, um, the, the, the the experiences that kids have had. This number might have increased to uh, to seventy percent. Now we have some more data that com that confirms uh, that confirms that. But I wanted to put all this in context, right? So we were saying that before the pandemic, learning uh, we were already talking about learning crisis, learning poverty was going up. Now it's now it's even worse. Learning poverty is even higher. Um, and then, but then we uh, we wanted to compare that with the narrative of the SDGs, right? The SDG four, right, on education, says, and that has been signed by countries in 2015, right? And they signed that by 2030, all children, all children will have would would have quality primary and quality secondary education. That was con that what countries have agreed to. So you can say, well, quality primary education is, well, at least it's a system that can teach you how to read with understanding. It's a, even a low bar of a quality education system. But they implicitly, they are, I mean, countries have been signing for a learning poverty level of zero. Of zero. So that's the SDG for 2030. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Right? It's impossible that we go from where we are today in terms of the share of kids in low and middle income countries that cannot read to zero. That will not happen. So, I mean, a bunch of countries, about 60 countries have already sent to UNESCO revised targets for, the, for, 20, for 2030. And roughly those revised targets of that subset of countries are roughly co coincide with reducing this learning poverty by half. 
so on, right, from 70 to 35. But even if this happens, if this reduction happens, that will be a gigantic improvement of the quality of education systems that we have never seen in our lives. Even that reduction, only to half, will imply an improvement uh, in learning, an improvement in the quality of the systems, which will be your responsibility, actually, right, that we have not seen in the past. So you have a tough job. You really have a tough job for the next 15 years. Now, um, that was the global number, right? And that's what's in the, uh, that's this yellow uh, line here. So going to 57 and going to, to 70, but I just wanted to do the disaggregation by regions. Right? And uh, as you can expect, so Latin America, which is this light blue one, and South, South Asia, the green one, are the ones who have seen the steepest increases in learning poverty. Right? But if we look at the different regions, I mean, the challenge of the crisis is much larger in sub-Saharan Africa than in other regions. Right? So that 50-something, even before the pandemic, even if we look at the pre-pandemic levels, Right, that 50 something that I was the average, right, was about um, about 50 in Latin America, but it was about 90 in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? And Eastern and Central East Asia was lower, and uh, Europe and Central Asia it was even lower, right? But the numbers in Sub-Saharan Africa are extremely, extremely high. So several of you were interested in education in Sub-Saharan Africa. The homework is even even more complicated, and we will talk a little bit more about that later. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you is, uh, maybe we can cl close this, this door, or no? I don't know, it's a, okay, okay, so it doesn't have to do anything with that door. So, okay, so I'll, I'll start shouting, so that'll bother them. <laughs> so, uh, what, what, um, what I wanted to show in this, in this graph is, um, for the few countries for which we have real data, this is not simulations. This is real data of learning losses. And unfortunately, we have more data of learning losses for richer countries, which are the ones that the, the green dots, than for um, low and, and, and middle income countries. We don't have a lot of data for low and middle income, real data pre and post pandemic. We have some. And in general, we see that there is kind of a correlation that gives like a one to one, right? So one month of school closures is about one month of learning losses. Right, so, so you can just picture in some of the countries that have been closed for two years, is roughly equivalent to kids having lost two years of their education. And, um, and, as, I, and as, as I was saying before, that experience was not the same for all children within a country, even within a country. So some have good conditions in order to learn, to, to maintain some engagement with education systems. Others were completely um, um, uh, disengaged from the education system. This is data, this is real data, uh, or it is a sample, this is not nat national data, it's data collected by the NGO in Mexico, and shows that in low-income households, loss, learning losses were much larger than, uh, than in high-income households, where there were learn learning losses as well, right? But there was some differentiation across income levels. So, and we have data for Brazil, data for Bangladesh, that shows exactly that same pattern, right? M much larger learning losses for um, lower-income households. Now, the other pattern that we see, and, and we see that also in rich countries, right? Netherlands, UK, US, right? We see, the, again, the same pattern, right, of a differentiation of those learning losses across the income across the income scale. Uh, now, one, one thing that is a bit different compared to other um, unequal pattern, patterns of inequality is sometimes we say, well, the losses were higher for the poorest and the most marginalized, right? In this case, it's a bit different. In this case, it's been that the losses have been smaller for the wealthy. So the top 10% or the top 20% who had all these conditions, who were able to have some Zoom classes with their, with their, with their teachers and had all the conditions in their homes in order to maintain the, the educational engagement, that particularly in these countries is the top 10 or 20%. So the ones who were disengaged are, the, are not the bottom 20%, are the bottom 80 or the bottom 70. 
right? So actually, that's something that should worry us. We don't have enough data yet, but that's something that should worry us in terms of future patterns of inequality. Right? We were already living in a world of highly unequal opportunities. Well, this is worse now. This is much worse now. Now, uh, if we go to, um, to numbers, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, potential lifetime earnings, say if you have two years of, if you lost two years of education, and education systems do not do anything, right? Um, then you would be in, in, it's like saying I'm gonna accumulate one or two years less of education than the previous or the future generation, right? So this, this simulation show what, what's the potential earnings loss for this generation of these kids who happen to be in school age during the pandemic, right? And the potential of lost future income is $11 trillion, which is about 10% of global GDP. And this is, a, this, is, this is the loss, not for economies, this is the loss, the potential loss for this group of people, for this generation of people, right? Roughly on average is about a 10% drop in their future earnings. Right, which is huge. We're talking about 10% drop in their lifetime earnings, right? Which could be, this number could be around 18% for those kids in countries in which we have two years, right? This is an average of countries that have had very different experiences. So, um, so but, but, but this will be the case if we don't do anything. And that's not the case. I mean, we can do things, right? And we are in time to try to recover some of those losses. But this is what could happen if we don't do anything. Now, before going, going to some of the potential policies f in terms of trying to address the learning loss issues, a couple, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes in terms of what are some of the lessons that this pandemic has, has, has left us. And one is that, and many of these things are, might be obvious, right? But they're not, all right? One is the role of schools. Right? At some point, we say, well, with technology, right, if people can learn, kids are smart, just give them a laptop and they will learn uh, by themselves. Well, no. Learning is a human interaction process, right? Learning is about an interaction between a teacher and a student and between a student and, and, and other peers. So <clears throat> the school is a source of socialization, right, that cannot be replaced. That's very difficult that will be replaced by technology, at least probably in our lifetimes. God knows, God knows later, but at least for now, very difficult that that's going to be replaced by technology. Second, the school is an equalizer of opportunities, right? And even, even, inside, even in a poor school, you will find kids that will come from very different backgrounds, right? Not all kids are the same, right, in terms of their conditions at home when you come to school, but when they come to a school, right, there is the potential that they will feel the same experience than kids that are less wealthy than, than, than them. Right? So the school has, all schools have a potential of equalization of opportunities and obviously well-run public systems right, could be a, a great equalizer. Not necessarily that's happening today, but this is the potential. And the schools is the space for learning with joy, with rigor, with purpose. Right? So, so that's something that I mean, we need, really need to recover the role of schools. Second is the essential role of teachers. Right, as I was saying, this is about education, it's about human interaction, um, it's a two-way interaction, and we know, we know, probably we knew before the pandemic, but now we and parents know what the role of teacher is, and the teachers are not a source of knowledge, the teachers are a source of inspiration, right, the teachers must be a source um, of, of um, uh, of creativity, of must be a source um, of someone, I mean, that they must be someone who will coach you and mentor for you to be able to learn by yourself, right? Not easy. That basically defines that teaching is a very, very complicated and tough profession, right? But that's now, now we, now we, we know, societies might know more and might internalize that better. And the third is teacher professional development is absolutely critical. Right? And the way we do that teacher's professional development is something that we really need to question, and we're going to mention a couple of, of, of additional issues on that later. Third, this balance between technology and the human factor. 
right? The uh, so much talk about technology. Some many of you are interested in technology. Great that you're interested in technology, but technology is not to replace a teacher. Technology is to support and leverage the work of the teacher, right? And the future is going to be about that balance. That I mean, that art of balancing technology with the human factor, right? We need we need both things. Technology today, unfortunately, technology has the potential to be a huge equalizer. And we have heard many stories of that. Well, with technology, I mean, a child in a rural area could have, could be taught by the best professor, right, in a top university in the, in the world. So many stories about how technology can really give opportunities to many poor kids, which might be true, yes. But that's the potential. As of today, as we have seen during the pandemic, technology is still a great unequalizer because some children have access to uh, the devices that are needed, the connectivity that are needed, right? And to the, the whole ecosystem that allows them, right, in order to, allows them to use technology effectively, and others not. So these ones are much better, much, much better than those kids who do not have access to, the, to technology. So actually, as of today, that potential of technology of being the great and equal, equalizer has not been realized. Uh, and then finally, I think it's critical, uh, a critical lesson is the role of parents. That everyone knows parents are critical, right? But now it's even clearer, right? That uh, parent, parents, like it or not, are protagonists of the future of their children, right? That's very clear for some parents. I hope it will be clear. It is already clear for you for whenever you're going to have kids, uh, but not, not be clear for many others, right? And actually, one thing is that uh, parents being a partners of teachers, parents being a partners of schools for the education process is something that we need to push for through public policy, right? Public policy is great. That is about improving schools, great. But at the same time, public policy should be also about improving conditions at home, right? Some rich systems during the pandemic were able to ensure a package of reading material to all children. Doesn't matter if they were rich or poor, right? Why? Because you worry about the conditions at home, right? And second, you need to worry about giving parents, right, the, uh, um, the tools in order to support the education process of their, of their children. That's not something that necessarily we should think that will be automatic and that all parents will behave the same. No, we need, that should be part of public policy. Now, um, so we're in trouble, right? We knew that before the pandemic. Now it's worse, right? Can we do something? And the answer is yes. We know how to run a decent school, right? I mean, not a perfect school but a decent school. But before that, let me, let me go to what to do now, even with the resources that we have, right? We know that we need to do teachers reform in many countries, but this year and next year and the following year, there's no time, right, to wait for the teachers reform. We need to do something with the resources that we have today in order to improve the experience of that child that has come after one or two years outside the classroom. And um, one thing that we put together with a bunch of partners in the, uh, in, the in the bank, working with uh, with uh, USA, UNESCO, UNICEF, and the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, was basically to to put together um, what has been what is the menu of policies, but basically looking at what many countries are already doing. Right? But many other countries are not doing much. It's a very heterogeneous response as of now. Some countries have really a good understanding that they are in trouble, that they need to do something different in their classrooms today, while other countries are not doing much, and the only thing that they have done is that they just open schools again, and that's it. Now, so what, what is very quickly, what is that key elements of what, what, what will be interesting to see in countries? The first one, and we call this a rapid approach just to, uh, to facilitate remembering this is, one is the R is about reaching every child, make sure that kids are back to school, right, and we retain them in school, so which is not something that um, is automatic, particularly kids in secondary, a, a, a secondary um, a school age, because they might be working, right, they have been disengaged for the system for two years, so they might not come back to school just because the school is open. So you need a specific policies in order to do that. Second is that you need to assess learning, 
right? We need to know where we are. School systems need to know where they are. What's the magnitude of their learning of their learning losses? Uh, and we see that in many countries, right? So. Uh, some states in India, uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, they have been very, South Africa, they have been active in terms of measuring learning during the pandemic and, and right after the pandemic to know what's the extent of losses. Other countries, even some countries who have the capability of measuring learning, uh, they are not doing it, even if they have the national capacity to do it. Maybe because of fear that the results are going to be very bad. Uh, at some point uh, after 2021, some countries were, were, were saying, but we have implemented some measures in terms of remote learning, right? If we measure learning and we show that learning losses are big, then that will show that our remote learning efforts have been futile or have not been effective. So let, let's postpone it for, for later, right? And, there's a big mistake. There's a huge mistake, right? So we need to make sure that, that systems measure learning and also that systems give teachers the tools to measure what's happening with learning inside their classrooms. Because remember now you are a fifth grade teacher, you're gonna have a group of children now that some of them will have the competencies of the fourth grade, others the third grade, others the second grade. Right? And it's always been like that, where right? old, cl old classrooms are heterogeneous. Right? Old classrooms always, right? some kids move faster, other kids require more support, well, but that heterogeneity now is larger. Right? And, children, and teachers must know where each child is right? in order to be able to build on the level where the child is today. Teachers cannot just, I mean the fifth grade, and say, I'm going to teach the fifth grade curriculum. Because most of the class is going to be lost, right? And will not be able to understand. So you cannot teach what the curriculum says that should be teaching today in this in this juncture. So that requires also, if we go to the uh, to the uh, the third column, to that P is that we need to be pragmatic, right? We need to recover learning that has been lost. We probably are not going to be able to cover the whole curriculum. Right, so we need to prioritize subjects, and within subjects, we need to prioritize what's critical in order to move to the next to the to the next grade. Now, it's not a bad idea to prioritize, particularly in many of our countries in which we already have very long and dense curriculums that usually the teacher would only know the material of half of the curriculum, even before the pandemic. Right, so using this moment in order to prioritize is not a, is not a bad idea. But now, I mean, in, in addition to that, to that prioritization, which we see in some countries, right? Some countries say, well, let's focus in a core curriculum, right? Others are not doing that, right? or others are telling, no, you need to cover everything, right? Which is something that de facto will not happen in any case, right? It's going to be impossible for teachers to cover the whole curriculum. But it's better that you do it in an organized, an orderly, an orderly way. But in addition to that, you need to increase the efficiency of instruction, right? And we need to give teachers, systems must give teachers the tools in order to be able to teach to that much more heterogeneous class, right? Depending on the level of a country, so emphasizing lesson plans, particularly when you have teachers who have low capacity, right? You must give lesson plans and you got, must give them methods in order to address it heterogeneity and be able to teach at the right level. And then finally, we need to develop psychosocial health and well-being uh, interventions because we always need this for children, but now it's even worse after the experience that they have gone through uh, in, the, in the pandemic. Now, w one thing that I was telling you was that we need to do today, right? That, that, that uh, um, mix of interventions is something that we must do today, right? This last, this next two or three years. And there's some countries who are thinking it well, right? And particularly I was thinking of an example of a few states in Brazil who already have a plan and saying, look, in the next in the next three years, we need to cover the essential material of five years. Okay? It's gonna be tough to implement that, right? But uh, but it's a plan, right? It's a good recognition, right, that they have lost time and they must I mean, prior, prioritize and adjust their curriculum in order to make sure that three years later, kids should be at the level or try to be at the level that they would have been without a pandemic. 
right? That's the idea. That's the state of Pernambuco. That's the state of Serra. That are trying to to uh, trying to do that. That's great. Um, more complicated with kids who have, are finishing, right? Their uh, their um, uh, their school period, but um, but that will require other 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 interventions. But um, but that's a plan. There are some countries who do have a plan, and this is this is uh, this is what we call this rapid approach. But in addition to what we need to do now in the short term, with the resources with that, that we have, with the teachers that we that we have, it is also that countries have to continue working on what was their homework even before the pandemic, right? Many countries had to, for instance, reform their teachers' careers. Right, and reform their careers so such that they hired the right people to be teachers, that they promote the, promote them efficiently, that they promote them meritocratically, that they have the right teachers professional development policies. Those are structural policies, right, that should continue to happen and have to start today as well. So you need to address the learning losses and at the same time work on those reforms. Right, that would have been critical in any way, even without the pandemic. Right, reforms that have to do with preparing learners and investing in early child education. Reforms that have to do with the teachers' careers. With reforms that have to do with classrooms being equipped for learning and making sure that in all classrooms there is a there is material for the child. There is the right uh, guide uh, guide for the teacher or lesson plans for the teacher. Um, and there is the right curriculum. There is the right assessment. I know those things there, and there is instructional cohesion between all those things, right? Because, I mean, we have seen, right, that the training, training goes on one side, the work of the student goes on the other side, and the lesson plans is completely different, and then you are assessed on something else because it's another department of the ministry who's in charge of assessment and does not coordinate with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with those people who are doing the teacher professional development, right? We see those, those, those failures. We need to make sure that there's instructional coherence of all those elements being thought with the idea of improving the experience in the classroom. Countries need to work on schools being safe and inclusive, right? Inclusive in terms of making sure that they have the right intervention for any child with any type of disability, safe in terms of less gender-based violence in schools. So all those are structural reforms that must continue, right? So, so systems, and this is difficult if you're going to work in a Ministry of Education, today must work with the with the inputs and with the elements and the uh, people that they have today to address the losses and at the same time to engage on those structural reforms needed in order to improve quality, the quality of the system. So what I want to close is, and this will be like five minutes around final time, um, is that we have urgent reforms that must be implemented, right? Many countries are delivering today a decent and decent quality education at the primary and secondary education level, right? It's really not rocket science, right? There's always debate on how to improve, but given the minimum, con the minimum conditions and making sure that at least kids have the fundamental skills that they need is not something that is rocket science. So the question is why is not happening in so many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, in East Asia, etc.? Why is that not happening? Right, so I'm gonna talk about a few ingredients that I called uh, ingredients or commitments that we have in order for successful uh, uh, political reforms. I'm gonna talk quickly about these four factors that must be in place in order to be able to implement those structural policies, but even the short run policies that are needed for, uh, to, to combat the learning losses. I'm gonna talk quickly about these four elements. The technical design, operational and implementation capacity, political alignment, and money, right? As four key elements that are needed uh, in order to implement successful reforms. When I talk about technical design, right, it's a, for instance, for a program to recover learning losses now, that will be a design that I would need. Uh, we just need to have a reasonable technical design. We always say, well, let's run a pilot, then we're going to wait three years to have the results of the pilot, right? And then we're going to show that the pilot was wrong, we'll have another pilot, and then you're out of government, right? After the whole process happened, right? 
So you need to have a reasonable technical design using all the practice. I, I sometimes people say using the good practices that you see, or the best practices that you see in other parts of the world. My sense is that you need to learn from all practices, right? From the best practices and also from the bad practices, because sometimes those bad practices were good designs that were not well implemented. So you better learn from that, right? So use all the evidence that is available in your country and elsewhere and design the best that, the best that you can and have a reasonable technical design that you know is not going to be perfect at the first time. And even you have a pilot, usually a pilot that are a small scale, right? There are things that when you do them at scale, they will not work the same as when where you're doing it in a pilot in a, in a, in a, in a pilot basis. So, um, so just you, you need to run, do your best possible technical design, avoid a paralysis due to a lack of complete information of what were best. Not we cannot over overanalyze every everything that matters, right? But then make sure that whatever is implemented with the best, with all the information that you have, is that you need, you must use impact evaluation and process evaluations to see what's happening with implementation, right? And be in a constant iterative learning, I mean, iterative policy learning process, right? The second point I wanted to emphasize is the issue of operational implementation capacity. Suppose you have a great design of your teacher's career reform, of your learning losses program, um, of your fellowship program that you want to implement to increase access of poor kids to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to school. Suppose you have the right design. My sense is that the differences in effectiveness on any policy are more related to the differences in implementation than the difference in the, de in the design itself. Right, remember that design has many, many parameters, right? And you can fail on only one parameter, right? And the thing might not, the policy might not work, right? You were, you were relying on a coaching program, right? But maybe you made, you failed in terms of the ratio of coaches to teachers was not the right one. Or you have a right, a coaching program and you failed in the terms of reference of how to hire the coaches, right? And all the rest was fine, right? Or the number of visits of the coaches to the teachers, right? There is a minimum of five visits, and you only had money for three, and with three you cannot get the right interaction between the coach and the teacher. And just giving a random examples, right? But you see, there are many parameters that you need to choose. If one is wrong, maybe the whole thing might fail, right? So it is about implementation capacity. But that shows how complex is the education service, right? People say sometimes, and I hate when they say that education is a soft sector. Right? There's nothing soft about education reform. Right? Try, to, try to deal with the union, and then you'll tell me if education is a soft sector. Right? So I wonder if people who work in central banks doing monetary policy right, is tougher than doing education policy or then implementing education policy. Right? Well, you fix the exchange rate or the, you, you, uh, you, you, you fix the exchange rate policy, I mean, you can screw it up and then the whole country will be a disaster. But but then the implementation is kind of, okay, there's an automatic system that will allow for that, in, for that implementation once you decide it. In education is different, right? The implementation is about changing the quality of the daily experience of millions of students, right? Implementing education policy is about a large, course, large particularly we're talking about public education, we're talking about a, a large scale service, that must be provided or regulated by the public sector, and it's about changing the experience in, say, in a country like Peru, like my, my, my country, in 60,000 schools, working with almost half a million teachers, and change the lives of seven million students, right? In an experience that has to happen every single day, right? That's the treatment. Right? The treatment of a vaccine is once you have all the investments into develop the vaccine, which is extremely complicated, once you do that, then it's a one shot. And the treatment is given. The treatment in education is years of interaction. So it's much more, more complication and it's transaction intensive. Right? It's about hum, uh, human interaction of many agents that are in contact with the beneficiary. Right? So it is not physics. Right, it's not A, I change A, that will generate this change in B. 
and I can predict that with certainty as will be in physics, right? This is a human change here that will have an impact of a hu another human, human change here between, say, the authority to the principal, from the principal to the teacher, and from the teacher to the student. All, those, all that change is about humans changing behavior. And that's extremely difficult to predict. And we can try, and we'll guess, but it's very difficult. So, so that's what makes a, the, the need to have a very high quality um, bureaucracy in order to implement policy a critical condition. And that's something that we sometimes forget. Performance in education is much less about the inputs. It's important to have the inputs. I mean, it's great that in this classroom I have the PowerPoint, I have, you have nice desks. I mean, we have our conditioning, we're our heating now. Great to have that, right? But actually, the most important part are not those physical inputs, inputs, but the interaction between people, right? And that's 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 the part that would where we fail. It is individual and collective behavior of agents at the different levels that will define the experience of the of the student. Now, to do that, and suppose that we do that great in this classroom, the problem is that we need to do this in hundreds of thousands of classrooms in a country. Right? And that has to happen every day. So management of the education process is very complicated. And it's not a pedagogical issue only. Yes, of course, you need to have pedagogues and teachers who will, who will um, change the curriculum, study what will be the best, the best I mean, teaching methods. Of course, all that is important. But if you have to replicate this many, many, many times, you have a managerial and logistical challenge as well. So in a ministry of education, you need to have accountants, you need to have uh, engineers, you need to have experts on public management, you need to have lawyers, you need to have psychologists. You, you must have a bureaucracy that has all the disciplines and it's of the highest quality. If you go to any country, you go to any country and ask in that country, where is the best bureaucracy here? What will people answer? They will answer the central bank. Ministry of Finance, the Army, in some in some countries, right? But they will never say the Ministry of Education or any social ministry, right? And that's a big mistake. That is a big mistake. I mean, if countries are saying education is the most important thing, the politicians say education is the most important thing for development, then why you don't have the highest quality bureaucracy in your in your countries? So one of the challenges is that there must be meritocratic systems in order to select the bureaucracy at all levels and you must have a meritocratic system to select all the agents that are involved in the education system particularly teachers and principals but and unfortunately we see many education systems in which the selection of teachers and the selection of principals is done on a political basis if you belong to the party if you know someone then you'll be in the system. If that is not fixed, and that's a critical issue to fix in many low and middle countries, if that's not fixed, it's very, very difficult, or I would say impossible, to have a high quality education system. Doesn't matter all the technology that you put, all the inputs that you put, that will be relevant if what you have as teachers are people who are there because it's a job. If the government is using teaching as an employment program, then it's impossible that you have a high quality education system. So, um, so that, that's, that's why this issue of implementation capacity is something that we we'll need to look at when we look at all levels of the system, right? At the ministry level, at the local authorities level, and at the, at the, and, and at the school level. And then, uh, next to last, is the issue of political, political alignment. Um, first of all, there has to be an understanding of society, a real understanding of society, that education is critical for, for having a viable economy and society. It is not true that this is, is really internalized by many political systems or societies. It's not true. It has been for some, yes. Right? But for many, for many uh, uh, that's not the case. And there's not necessarily a common understanding of the magnitude of the challenge that, that, that we have. Um, and there's not necessarily a political determination that what the system needs to accomplish is a better outcome for students. 
right? It's an idea, okay, what do we need to do? We need to build more schools. We need to hire more teachers. We need to buy more textbooks. Okay, but you can, even if you do well all those things, they're just throwing inputs. That you throw inputs doesn't mean that there will be learning at all, at all. So um, there must be an alignment of all actors such that they understand that all their decisions regarding education policy must be uh, around uh, the welfare of the student. Right? There has to be a social contract in which everyone says, look, the reason we're making this change in policy and education is not because of the interest of the vendors or the interest of the union or the interest of the teachers or the interest of the bureaucracy or the interest of the parties or the political party, whoever is, is around, um, or the interest of any other player that is not the student. It, any decision has, has to be around, is this good for the student or not? Yes, we care about teachers. But people say, well, no, but he, an, an objective, and I mean, if you go to some countries now and say, well, what's the objective to improve welfare of teachers? Well, I say, well, yes, of course I care about the welfare of teachers because that is critical for the welfare of students. Because if I only care about the welfare of teachers, well, I should have a separate employment program. That's another development objective that doesn't have to do anything with education. Right? If I care about uh, teachers, it's because they are the conduit to provide a better experience to a better experience to students. So, actually, all the decisions in a certain to a, to a certain extent, so we're talking that all decisions should be technical decisions, because it's about thinking if these decisions are improving the welfare and the education experience of students. So you need to take politics out of any decision, right? So many cases that you see politics are part of a decision because of the union pressure, because of the builders' pressure, because of the uh, people who uh, publish textbooks are uh, make uh, expert pressure. You need to take those out. You need to take all those political issues out of any decision making in education. And that's something that um, I was told by the, um, the major of Ceará in Brazil, that is this case of a, uh, a small municipality that has improved dramatically, and, and later the state of Ceará in Brazil improved dramatically um, um, their learning standards within Brazil. And uh, one of the things that they did is they changed their Politic, the, the way they recruit teachers to a meritocratic, um, uh, to a, to a meritocratic system, um, and what the mayor there told me is that what we did is we took politics out of education, but that's a political decision. It's the political decision of taking politics out of education. If that doesn't happen, it's going to be very difficult that. Any, despite any other thing that we do, that we improve the quality of the system. So, uh, and then we, we if, if we do have that political support, then we should be able to, to put the financial resources, the managerial resources, the human resources that are needed in order to improve the, the education of the system. And finally, in terms of money, one thing that should worry us uh, uh, about a lot is the huge, large, huge differences in spending per students across countries and within countries. And here I'm putting data only across countries. So, um, and I'm, I'm gonna mention this because there's always a discussion about, is it about more money or using efficiently the money that you have, right? And the answer is both, right? But why you would need more money in low and middle income countries, because if you just compare in high income countries, in all, the average of OECD, Right, it's about eight thousand dollars per student per year. This is this is uh, this is primary education. Right, eight thousand dollars in the U.S. is with eleven thousand or twelve thousand, right, per student. Right, in uh, upper middle income countries, one thousand. Right, in low middle income countries, three hundred. Right, Peru, my country is around one thousand. Right, and low income countries is fifty three. Right. When I saw this first, this the, the first time I saw this number, I thought that was a typo or there's a mistake in the calculations. It cannot be 53, right? But it is. It is. So if you go to Niger, right, those or to Mali, right, or to Burkina Faso, this will be the levels of spending. 
right? So you can say, well, you need to be more efficient. Probably yes, they must be more efficient because there's very large rates of school. Uh, I'm sorry, of teacher absenteeism, right? Which is the most evident you um, evident uh, proof of inefficient use of resources, right? If you're paying teachers and they don't come, well, obviously that's an inefficient use of resources, right? True. So there is a space to be more efficient. Yes. But if you're spending $53, it's gonna be very difficult, right? That you're gonna have high quality education, right? So you need to spend more resources in many, in many instances. So it is true, political priorities must be translated into financial efforts. There is a need of efficiency in many cases, but there's no magic. In many cases, you, de you do need more resources. However, at the same time, we need to think that uh, sometimes it's the, re the resources are the binding constraint, and the solution is just buy more inputs, right? And that's a big mistake as well. So we have to say, no, just give me more money. I buy books, and with that, I will solve everything. No, because you might buy the books, but if the books that are not accompanied by the right professional development to teachers, are not accompanied by the right workbook, are not accompanied by the right lesson plans for the teachers, then your books will be irrelevant. Right? And there is a famous, I mean, impact evaluation of Starduflo and others of a paper called Textbooks, and they show that investing in textbooks has zero returns, right? Okay, well, the conclusion of that paper is that you should not buy textbooks, no. Right? You should buy textbooks, but any input by itself might have zero impact. Right? So it's not an issue of more money only. Right? It's more money, but it has to be used as part of an integrated, and any input has to be used as part of an integrated package. So, um, so yes, money sometimes is abiding constraint, but it's not just, just give me money, I buy something, and then I'll have learning. Right? Um, now, one problem that we do have is that even if we know what to do, we're doing things well, right? If I can say, okay, this is the minimum package that I, that I need. So I hire Alec as a consultant. He went to the country and said, look, what you need to do is um, this type of teacher development, uh, teacher professional development, accompanied by this minimum material, right? And this minimum inputs for the, for the child. And if you have that package, then learning might happen, right? That implied a certain number, right? $100, whatever. Right? Then what's the, what's the budget that I need? Is 100 multiplied by all the number of kids that I have in that grade, multiplied by all the grades that I have, right? And then I have, okay, bingo, this is the number, this is what I need. This is what I need of resources. We sell, we, I said never, yeah? Calculate education budgets that way, right? In terms of how much is the minimum that I need in order to provide a decent service to all students, right? I have that number, I go to the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Finance says, well, sorry, that's 10 times what you are spending today, right? I say, okay, fine, let's have a plan. For the next, in the next 15 years, we're gonna reach that number, which implies that we'll need to increase taxes in order to be able to collect that amount of, amount of resources, right? So that's the right social contract, right? One in which you define what's the minimum that you need in order to give all students in your country a minimum service, a minimum, at least a minimum quality service, and you collect the taxes needed in order to pay, to pay for that. Um, and, and, and actually, the challenge is that usually we're talking about gigantic amounts of money, right? The education sector is a big sector. Right? In many countries, the education sector could be between 15 and 25 percent of the, uh, of the uh, public budget. So you could be talking about a fifth of the state is education. Right? So education, to a certain extent, is a macro sector. So the discussions between the Minister of Education and the Minister of Finance had to be a very horizontal discussion. Right? We're not talking a, a marginal sector from a, even from a budget perspective. But you can move, you can shift aggregate demand through the education sector, All right? So it's a macro, it's, it's a macro sector as, 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 as well. So uh, this just puts together, putting together all these elements, you see, well, this is very complicated, right? We know how one classroom works, how a decent classroom works, we know that, but we need to do that at scale, right? And we need to do that for all children in a country, right? 
which doesn't mean that we need to, when I was saying, well, we need what, that $100 per student in order to provide them that package. Usually that 100 is not the same across the whole country. Right? Probably that 100 has to be larger in rural areas or will have to be larger for kids with a disability. Right? If you want to give the same opportunities to everyone, that doesn't mean that you need to spend the same amount of money for everyone. Probably you need to spend more for some kids in order to give them the same opportunity, to give everyone the same, the same opportunity. But if you put together those elements of financing, the elements of, um, of, of the political alignment, implementation, and obviously the an analytical work needed for design, it is, it is a complex process. But, um, but that's why you are in these master's degrees in order to get all the skills that are needed to, to do that, and this will be part of your uh, challenge. Uh, in your in your countries and we count on you thank you very much